Good morning. Welcome. Happy Sabbath. Let's have a uh, word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for the Sabbath day. The single most important day in the universe happens every week. And every new Sabbath is more important than the last one because it's that much closer to the crisis or the, the end of the situation. Be with us, Father. Be with your people that they awaken and stop playing silly games. Be with your people that we seek your spirit like never before. And the outpouring of him will be unprecedented, Father, to get this work done and drive home this last message. May your people understand that it's not by men, not by PhDs and theologians and superstars, but it's simply by the blood of Christ that all will be reconciled. Be with us here this Sabbath day. Be with your people throughout the world that are striving to hit the mark and, as your apostle says, to win the race and win the prize of eternal life. We praise you. We ask your presence. We crave your spirit. Cleanse us from all unrighteousness, but we have to choose that. And may we be willing to stand in the furnace as those men in Babylon did that the world may behold your Son. In Jesus' holy name, we pray and ask. Amen. We're going to continue in the book of Acts. However, due to the nature of things, it is imperative and to understand the Holy Spirit I, I'm not talking about the foolishness that's flying around out there and all this ridiculous notions and ideas and, oh, you have to go here and hear this and you have to read this and read that. No. As it is laid down in the scripture and in the spirit of prophecy and the ridiculous argument over Roman Catholic issues is Trinity and Godhead and blah, blah, blah. No. I'm talking about it as laid down in the scripture and the spirit of prophecy. And if you're not willing to accept the plain thus saith the Lord, then, well, you're not willing to accept the facts. And this is an evolutionary mindset that two and two don't equal four. We have been, our education system, Christian and secular, has been under the delusion that evolution is a fact for uh, generations, and it has taken its effect because you make things up as you go. And if you don't believe, the culmination of this now is this ridiculous gender thing. Facts don't matter. That's an evolutionary uh, doctrine. We're going to change the books. We're going to make it what we want it to be. So as far as the Holy Spirit goes, oh well, the scripture's clear. Spirit of Prophecy is very clear who he is, what he is, what his job is. And to continue in the book of Acts, we have to comprehend Christ's ministry, the Melchizedek priesthood. And that's what we're going to look at, Melchizedek. And this is going to be this week and, I don't know, the next time I'm up here. And I've been talking about this for 30 years. However... I'm going to approach it a little differently this time because something dawned on me. Without understanding the blood of Christ as it's laid out in the scripture, you cannot understand the Melchizedek priesthood, not by any stretch of the imagination because that is the cornerstone, the blood of Christ. And we're going to start in Revelation 13 with a very profound statement that is ignored in Adventism. It's ignored in Christianity. You know, the funny thing is the only ones that make a big deal out of the blood are the Catholics because they've got it in everything. 
and they claim to own it and control it through the Melchizedek priesthood, through Melchizedek of the ancient world, and they make no bones about it. The Roman Catholic Church, and it's amazing how many Seventh-day Adventists adhere to the Roman Catholic doctrine on Melchizedek, claim that through Melchizedek, because the Melchizedek priesthood is a superior priesthood to an earthly priesthood, it is their claim to the Eucharist, to transubstantiation, claiming that they change alcohol and wheat into blood and flesh, literally, at their whim, at their command. It is through the Melchizedek priesthood that they claim their perfection of priesthood exists, and it is superior to any other priesthood. I have the documentation. It's quite simple. Just Google it and, and ask the Catholic position on Melchizedek. If you're not appalled at what they say, uh, you'll be, uh, you're desensitized. And it also gives them claim that their priesthood is divine, infallible, because of the Melchizedek. And it's amazing, they recognize Melchizedek as deity, but we don't. Hmm. But we're going to start with the blood of Christ, and we're going to Revelation 13, and here we see a very interesting statement that is made. And again, it is mostly ignored and not expounded upon or talked about, but it is the hinge and key point in Christ's ministry. Without it, there is no ministry. And the reason Paul, John recorded it this way is because it has to be this way and without any further ado, let's read it. Revelation 13 and verse 8. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, who, worship him whose names are not written in the book of the life of the Lamb, slain from the foundations of the world. If any man have an ear, let him hear. Okay, all those who are not on Christ's side are going to worship the Pope, ultimately Lucifer, who are not written in the Lamb's book of life. And the Lamb was slain from the foundation of the world. What does that mean? What is the implication? What was John saying? Now, real quick, I want to run, jump over to Hebrews 22 because this sheds more light on what it means. And I'm going to let the scriptures, I'm not going to explain it. I'm going to let the scriptures explain exactly why that verse is in the Bible and what it has to do with Melchizedek of Genesis, of the ancient world. Paul says here in Hebrews 9:22 And almost all things are by the law purged with blood and without shedding of blood is no remission It is it was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heaven should be purified with these but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. Now connect that with what John wrote. So the remission of sin, almost all things, and I'm not going to, yes, not everything, not all sins are forgiven because there's an unpardonable sin, et cetera, et cetera. But almost all things, our re, the remission of sin comes through blood. The, lame, the lamb slain from the foundation of the earth. How could the book of life be written from the beginning of earth without blood? From the beginning of the creation of the earth? Because there was going to be a conflict that was going to play out down here. See, they knew that this was going to happen. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit knew there was going to be a rebellion. Eons ago, before they created this place, 
Paul talks about this in Ephesians. But prior to the conflict, they made the solution for all those who were accepted. So everybody was put in the Lamb's Book of Life from the beginning because they were all slated for salvation. We determine whether it stays there or not by accepting Christ's blood through obedience to him, to the Father, to the law. Does that make sense? So in order to enter names in the Lamb's Book of Life, there had to be blood. Oh, but Jesus wasn't crucified for 4,000 years. But you see, remember, Jesus said, if you think it and you want to do it, it's accounted to you as if you did it, whether you did it or not. The plan of redemption was there. Everybody had opportunity to the blood of Christ. Those who would not accept that blood were removed out of the book of life. By whose choice, by the way? So this had to be the arrangement. And we see all through the Old Testament, people going to heaven. How? How? How did Moses get forgiveness and was resurrected and went directly to heaven? How did Elisha go to heaven when there's sin recorded against these? It was through the blood of the lamb slain from the foundation of the earth. What happened at Calvary was the payment. The deal was done. Nothing. This is why Jesus never argued with the devil when he came to get Moses. The deal was done, baby. He's devil claimed Moses. Jesus said, no. No. Come out. He's coming with me because you see this blood that you're going to shed. And the, the irony of this is the devil shed that very blood that condemned him to the lake of fire. This is the Melchizedek priesthood. And there always has to be a representative of Melchizedek on earth. From when Adam sinned all the way down to the second coming, this will be in play. The blood will be in play. And there will be a representative of the Melchizedek priesthood, a divine representative, an immortal representative of the Melchizedek priesthood here on earth. That's why it says the order of. So there has to be at least two. It, without it, the plan doesn't work. Doesn't work. This is what this verse means. Now, I want to read something out of uh, <clears throat> Acts of the Apostles, page 229. Folks, this is very interesting. Of course, everything in the spirit of prophecy is... You don't have this book? That's too bad. You can get it real cheap if you want it. You know what I call our church? Electronic Christians. I see people coming to church. They don't carry a Bible anymore. They carry a computer. They carry a Kindle. They carry a Kindle. They carry their smartphones, which is just a computer and miniature, because many of the smartphones are far more powerful than most laptops. Unless you spend a real, real lot of money on a laptop. That's why a cell phone is a thousand dollars to twelve hundred bucks, because they're extremely sophisticated instruments. But they don't carry the Bibles. And most of the time when Seventh-day Adventists do, it's a NIV, which is not a Bible at all. It's a book written by men. Uh, 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 specifically written by Rome for the Protestants. But very few will carry a King James, which is the Protestant Bible. Never changed, still is. If you don't have one, you're being deceived. If you're not studying with one, you're... I don't get the these and the thous. Well, the Lord left them there, so you really have to study. Let me read this. It says, this is page 229. The uh, chapter is Thessalonica. For three successive Sabbaths, Paul preached to the Thessalonians, 
reasoning with them from the scriptures regarding the life, death, and resurrection, office work, and future glory of Christ, the land slain from the foundation of the world. Revelation, of course, 13.8. He exalted Christ, the, pro the proper understanding of whose ministry is the key that unlocks the Old Testament scriptures, giving access to their rich, Treasures. Did you hear that? The Melchizedek priesthood. Oh, it didn't say that, Paul. It did. It absolutely did. Why? Because it's talking about the lamb slain from the foundation of the earth, which is the blood that is used to minister in heaven with. There's no blood in heaven. No, nothing dies in heaven. But Jesus points, it says. He points to his blood. Where is that? Where does he, I know exactly where he points to. Do you? It's a guy named Ron Wyatt. To a very, very removed, tiny extent. Rita and I were involved in some of that. And I do emphasize removed. However, we had first-hand information and documentation of all Ron Wyatt's exploits and discoveries because an individual that was very close to our family was deeply involved and partnered with Ron Wyatt. Uh, both since are dead. And I even have a box, Rita and I even have a box of, 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 of ashes from Sodom and Gomorrah, sulfur balls, I don't know where it is, somewhere is, uh, I could dig it out, I guess, that came from there, um, interviews, statements by Ron Wyatt uh, uh, that no, nobody else has because this individual had given it to us before he died. And we were involved to a small extent. Beware of counterfeits in that area. I'm going to put that out there. Beware of WAR. Beware of many fakes, lies that are being told. Uh, there was a great deal of wrangling for control and power over that information, even up to including the fact that Ron Wyatt Hat could not live in his house anymore or really use WAR Museum anymore. However, he held the copyright to everything and he only gave it to one other person who actually at one time when that person was dying, I could have had that copyright, but I don't know. It just didn't work out that way. So I know very well about Ron Wyatt and I know when it says that Jesus points to his blood where he points, right under where the cross of Calvary was, where Ron Wyatt found the mercy seat that had the blood of Christ that went through that split rock and 29 feet above that cross to the top of the mercy seat because Ron Wyatt found the cross hole. And when the earthquake rent, this is very important to this, when the earthquake hit, when Jesus died, there was a reason for it because the cross hole where the, the plug, the, the, the Romans at their crucifixion site used to reuse their cross hole where they put their crosses and they put plugs in them so they didn't fill with debris. Well, Ron Wyatt found that spot. He found it. And it was many feet below the current road because it was filled in with debris. And they found the crack that went down the face of the escarpment because it says that the people looked up at Christ. But they could not figure out why the cross holes were actually below the current path that was there. But then they found out that much debris was put in there and built it up. And then they dug down and they found the original pavement. Absolutely, they looked up at that carve. And here was the crack. And they took the end off a 100-foot tape and they fed it down through the cross hole and it went down right on top of the mercy seat, 29 feet below, where the blood and water 
of Christ. You see, nothing happens by accident, and the Melchizedek priest gave up his life and became the Melchizedek priest earthly. Why do you think blood and water came out of his side when they stuck the spear in him? And, and John says, as we saw when I was talking about the Holy Spirit, the witness, the blood, the water, and the spirit is referring to this act that John witnessed himself. And he probably didn't understand at that time why when they stuck the spear in and the two quarts of blood and water that come out of a dead body, roll down his side, down his leg, down the wooden cross, down into the rock that would not absorb it, and dripped down on the mercy seat. Only way, and this is what convinced me that Ron Wyatt was no, this is the very thing that convinced me, that Ron Wyatt was no hoax. You tell me, Seventh-day Adventists, scholars of the scripture, which every one of us is supposed to be, but we're electronic Adventists. You see, the very thing Jan Markison said in 1998 and 1999 when Net 2000 hit and they put the video screens up, everybody would leave their Bibles and spirit of prophecy home. And that's what's happened. And we have become ignorant and dumb through our superstar educators who have dumbed us down. But folks, I ask you, the lamb slain from the foundation of the earth, the world, his blood went out and spilled on the ground. It was never applied. This is what convinced me that Ron Wyatt was absolutely spot on. Could not be any other way. Type met anti-type. Type met anti-type. That blood had to get on that earthly mercy seat. Otherwise, there was no sacrifice. Otherwise, there could not be an atonement. And when Ron Wyatt found that blood on that mercy seat, and he scraped it off, and he had it analyzed, and this blood was known to still be alive, and the chronosome count in it was bizarre, because there was only one male chronosome in there, and that's all it takes to have a male child. The rest were female. That was his father. Very strange chromosome count in that blood. This is documented. They asked, where did you get this blood from? He couldn't tell them when the laboratory analyzed it. But they were stunned and shocked. And the Bible says that Christ's body would never see corruption. In other words, decay. But you see, in our communion service, we take whatever is not eaten out of the bread and whatever is not juice that's not consumed. And what do we do with it? What do we do with it? The sacrifice, we dump it down the drain and bury it in the ground. Oh, my word. Is that an abomination, do you think, to God? Because the Bible says that Christ's body was never to see corruption. We are symbolically burying Christ in the ground and dumping his blood down the drain. No, that, every bit of that needs to be consumed at the communion service. Because at the cross, every bit of that blood that came down Christ's side, and of course, this is my thought, went down every bit that was necessary. And it was enough that came out of Christ to drip on that mercy seat and make an atonement once and for all, as John says, behold the Lamb of God, John the Baptist, which takes away the sin of the world. This is the Melchizedek priesthood. This is how Moses got into heaven. This is how Jesus and the Father were able to judge the cities of the plains because there was a representative of the Melchizedek priesthood there in the city of Salem that was exhibiting the commandments of God and the Holy Sabbath and the lifestyle of a Seventh-day Adventist to these people who had no excuse and the true government of God. They had no excuse. So you see, this has to be true. Forget Ron Wyatt.
Forget all the naysayers or all this one or that. That blood had to get on that mercy seat. And Mrs. White tells us in Prophets and Kings, I believe it's page 453, uh, I may be wrong, you can look it up, that Jeremiah took the mercy seat out of the temple, the ark, and he secreted it away in a cave before the Babylonian destruction came. And it was still there to this day, Mrs. White said, when she wrote that book. And it just so happens that where Ron Wyatt found the cross holes, the cave underneath in ancient documents was known as, guess what, Jeremiah's Grotto. So hundreds of years prior to Jesus' life on earth, his crucifixion, death, and resurrection, his father put the mercy seat under where the Roman crucifixion site of Golgotha was, where his son was to be sacrificed. So don't tell me that this verse in Revelation 13.8 is not 100% accurate. They knew. They made provision. That provision was accepted, and that provision was in play because, you see, Jesus explained to Adam and Eve after their sin what the deal was going to be. Jesus, and it is speculated, and this is one of the speculations I agree with, that when Jesus made clothing for Adam and Eve, he used, guess what? I would be willing to bet. And we will find out, hopefully I will find out, because I will be, I hope I am in heaven, that it was sheepskins that he made a covering for them for, with. I believe that to be true, because again, it fits. It's not conjecture. It's not two and two equaling three. It's not, we're going to make it what we want. Just as the lamb slain from the foundation of the earth gave rise to the Melchizedek priesthood. And that blood was being ministered with even in the Old Testament. Because you see, our prophet tells us to properly understand the Old Testament. What must we know? What did she say? What did I say? Page 229. What? Well, let me read that again. Because you see, the Christian world is saying we don't need the Old Testament. And when the Seventh-day Adventist church starts keeping Sunday, what are they done with the Old Testament? Thrown it out. Let me read this again. For three successive Sabbaths, Paul preached to the Thessalonians, reasoning with them from Scripture regarding the life, death, resurrection, office work, and future glory of Christ. You'll notice it says office work. What is office work? The Melchizedek priesthood. The lamb slain from the foundation of the world, Revelation 13, 8. His blood, his sacrifice. He exalted Christ, the proper understanding of whose ministry is the key that unlocks the Old Testament scriptures giving access to their rich treasures. So without the lamb slain from the foundation of the earth, there's no comprehension of the Old Testament. I don't care how well versed you are in understanding it, but if you're not applying the blood of Christ to the Old Testament, it's useless. They who study the scriptures unto their own destruction, such as the Jews who are teaching that there was Messiah has not come yet. They're not applying the blood that they shed at Calvary. So their minds, as Paul says, are darkened. Seventh-day Adventists who refuse to believe in the blood of Christ and are believing in the strength of men. You know, this is an amazing thing. We are, do you have people in this? You can't have anything to do with politics. Mrs. White says, which by the way is not what she says. Not what she says at all. 
not what she says. Oh, and if you vote for a candidate and any evil that he does or she does, you are responsible for. That's correct, so be careful. And what does that say? Analyze the character. However, however, they are full well on and fine with Ted Wilson and Dia, Mark Fenley, Doug Batchelor, Gates. Should I keep going? Fine with them. Do you think you're going to be held responsible for the evil that they are doing when you continue to support these ministries and conference with your tithe money? Which, again, is part of the Melchizedek priesthood. The blood of Christ. You are squandering the blood of Christ on politicians who are corrupting the church and bringing us into, the, brought us, not bringing us into this ecumenical movement. Electric Christians with their laptops and their videos, but have no comprehension of the scriptures. No, I'm not a scholar. I'm not a theologian. I'm not a PhD. I don't even have a ma well. I well, I don't have a master's. However. The Holy Spirit is above and beyond all that. They're indoctrinated. They're not educated. They're indoctrinated. They're not educated. If you don't believe me, look at what this church has done for the last three years in this crisis, so-called. Look what we've done. So we see clearly that without the comprehension of the lamb slain from the, what it means from the foundation of the earth. There's no understanding of the Old Testament. In which case now I want to go to Zechariah 3. Zechariah 3. The book of Zechariah is a fantastic book. All the minor prophets are uh, amazing. Uh, where are you? Zechariah 3. And I want to preface this with Prophets and Kings, page 582, because there's a very important principle here. And again, Prophets and Kings, so this is all about the Old Testament. I, I strongly recommend in the state we're in, you get this book out and read it, and why Babylon had to uh, uh, take over and destroy Israel. Pretty amazing, because we're at that right now. It says, this is amazing stuff. This is chapter 47, Joshua and the angel. Now, I want you to understand clearly the principles that are being set down here and how they affect, they're affecting us. And there is another principle, two things from the creation to the second coming that are paramount, far and above and beyond everything and eclipse it. Make it totally irrelevant because everything will be in the light of one of these two things or both of these two things and they are directly connected and it's gonna blow your mind as to what it is and many are not gonna agree with it and I really don't care because it's written here. And I believe it. It says here, this is chapter 47, Joshua and the angel. Oh, you don't have prophets and kings? Really? It's too bad. It's too bad. The steady advancement made by the builders of the temple greatly discomforted the alarmed and alarmed the hosts of evil. Now, I want you to understand, again, the blood of Christ enlightening the Old Testament. Destroy this temple, and in three days I will rebuild it. Well, I wonder what temple we would refer to in our time. How would you bring this up? Jesus said, this is my temple, this body. So the temple location was changing, or the center of the Shekinah, which is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, was changing from the organization to the individual. Does that make sense? See that mitre on his head? See that crown that all of us are going to wear? Holiness to the Lord, Kadesh la Yehovah. That's what it would be on the Jewish uh, mitre. That's everything. That's the temple. 
So I want you to transfer that in your mind. The steady advancement made by the builders of the temple greatly discomforted and alarmed the hosts of evil. I'm going to tell you, the steady advancement of the second and third angel's message calling people out of sin greatly alarmed the hosts of evil. So that would be our time. Satan determined to put forth still further effort to weaken and discourage God's people by holding before them their imperfections of character. Now we have the blood of Christ. If those who had long suffered because of transgression could again be induced to disregard God's commandments, they would be brought once more under the bondage of sin. Ecumenical movement. Ted Wilson. But you support him. I don't know about, but you go and you pay tithe and you participate. Remember, the candidate you back, you will be held responsible for the sin they do. And if you don't think these people are politicians, they are the worst kind. Do you realize that, at, and I said this last, I don't know, uh, Bill was talking, that at the special resurrection, at the second coming of Christ, it will be predominantly and vastly Seventh-day Adventists from the first century that will be called back because they're the ones that did what they did to Christ? Do you realize that? There'll be a few Romans in there, mostly the elite of the Seventh-day Adventist Church and the rabble that went along with them. Interesting. Just food for thought because they didn't want the blood of Christ. They didn't want the Holy Spirit. But they will be called back to a very special resurrection. Probably a lot of you don't even know what I'm talking about. Go study it out. Because Israel had been chosen to preserve the knowledge of God in the earth, they had ever been special objects of Satan's enmity. He was determined to cause their destruction. While they were obedient, he could do nothing to them to harm, to harm them. Nothing. Nothing. Therefore, he had bent all his power and cunning to entice them into sin. Ensnared by their, his temptation, they had transgressed the law of God and had been left to become the prey of their enemies. Now, these are the two things. Not in my opinion, but in the scripture and the spirit of prophecy that eclipse everything else. Everything in the Bible, everything in the spirit of prophecy comes under these one, the other, or both of these two things. The blood of Christ, number one. Number two, every evil act committed on this planet from Eve's sin, Adam's sin, Cain's sin, all the way down to the very last act even including when the new Jerusalem comes down and Lucifer rallies the dead that will come back, the wicked dead, are for one purpose and one purpose only. And it is this that I just read. It only stands to reason. Because Israel had been chosen to preserve the knowledge of God in the earth, they had ever been the special objects of Satan's enmity. He was determined to cause their destruction by whatever means necessary. Everything in the scripture, and you can't, this isn't even an arguable point, comes under one of these two or both. I would say arguably both. The lamb slain from the foundation of the earth and the enmity of the devil against God's people. The wars, the rape, the pedophilia, the transgender, the homosexuality, the violence, the brutality. All is to destroy God's people. Nothing else is important to Lucifer. 
That's, I'm not even going to argue about that. That's a fact. The great controversy. That is why that book is especially wearisome to Lucifer. He hates that book because it exposes it. And the great controversy only talks about two things. The lamb slain from the foundation of the earth and the struggle from the beginning of the fall to the return and the coming down of the new Jerusalem. What is the issue? To destroy God's people. I'm prefacing the Melchizedek thing with this, because if you don't understand the blood of Christ and the great controversy, you don't understand, and I don't care who you are, I don't care how many letters you've got after your name, you don't understand the Melchizedek priesthood, and you're going to make up all kinds of stupidity about it, and the devil's pleased. So you electronic Christians, get your books out. Get your books out. The work will be finished. How? How? Through literature evangelism. Period. This is why I'm not proceeding in the book of Acts. This needs to be understood because you see the very next thing we're going to talk about in Acts is a medical missionary work. Mrs. White goes on to say here, I love these books. And you see, she says, ensnared by his temptations, that's the devil, they have transgressed the law of God and have been left to become the prey of their enemies. That's why Paul recorded in Hebrews 9.22, almost all things are purged or forgiven through blood because some are not, because of the choice of the people. Yet, through, though they were carried as captives to Babylon, this is Israel, God did not forsake them. He sent his prophets to them, reproofs and warnings, and aroused them to see their guile, or lies, that's what that word means, when they humbled themselves before God and returned to him with true repentance, he sent them messages of encouragement, declaring that he would deliver them from captivity, restore them to his favor, and once more establish them in their own land. Folks, no matter what is about to happen, if we are keeping God's commandments, living as Jesus lived, nothing can hurt us, no matter how bad it gets. And we will prosper when our Savior returns. He's not coming back as a lamb, folks. He is coming back as a conquering and an offended king to take those who were loyal to him back and out of the devil's hands once and for all. It's going to be an interesting sight. And all those who at the special resurrection came up will be resurrected again. Or, I mean, that's when the special resurrection is to see this. Jesus said this to them when he was on trial. Him who they crucified and beat and tortured for hours and hours, riding on a cloud with millions and millions of a powerful host that will lay the earth low. And what are people arguing? Oh, the earth's flat, so we can see that. Really? This is a medieval ignorance put forth by Rome. And what are Adventists arguing about? Wow. And now that this work of restoration has begun and the remnant of Israel, of Israel had already returned to Judah, Satan was determined to frustrate the carrying out of the divine purpose. And to this end, he was seeking to move upon the heathen nations to destroy them utterly. 
Everything that takes place on this earth has to do with Christ's blood or the destruction of God's commandment. Keep everything keeping people. Again, Ezekiel's vision of a wheel within a wheel and so on and so forth. But a hand is upon it. While all may seem chaotic and out of sorts, and yes, we have to be afraid of Jesuits, and the motto of the Masons is order out of chaos. Ah! They've done their job well. You know, I've been studying the pirates. Very interesting, by the way. Those, uh, those men were, were, were not the criminals. I got news for you. Those men were not the criminals by any stretch of the imagination. Um, do you know that Blackbeard <laughs> never killed anybody? He was actually a pretty decent guy. He was very careful not to hurt people. He was moral to an extent. But you know what he learned early on? That fear was his best weapon and reputation got the job done. He didn't have to kill people. He didn't have to fire cannonballs. That was all not true. Not one bit of it. So the Jesuits. The Seventh-day Adventist church has been gutted by it, the fear of the Jesuits. Or, let's talk about Jesuits and not worry about the condition we're in because, you see, we're okay. Well, you know what? The Jesuits accomplished their task simply by that mindset. The books have been changed. Don't read them. But, of course, copyrights mean nothing anymore in that mindset. See, Blackbeard's or Tet teaches understanding of psychology is exactly what's working in the Seventh-day Adventist church. Fear the end times. Don't bring on persecution. But what about the blood of Christ? What about the protection? And all this time, the earth gets more and more and more evil and more atrocities. And we, oh, oh, it's so bad. But this is what we chose. Yes, every one of us. And I hear when I say that, not me, I'm a good set. No, you chose it because what have you done through your life to spread the gospel? I'm not talking about institutionally. I mean personally. What have you done? What have you done? You've sat in front of a computer and been entertained electronically and feel that you're good. Well, it ain't going to work that way. But in this crisis, the Lord strengthened his people with good words and comfortable words. Zechariah 1.13. Through an impressive illustration of the work of Satan and the work of Christ, he showed the power of their mediator to vanquish the accuser of his people. Okay. Another thing that we have looked at. The great controversy. The blood of Christ and the evil that is in the world. Every evil deed and act is committed and allowed because Satan, Lucifer, old scratch, is seeking to wipe out God's commandment, keeping people. And what is the theory behind that? Well, it's a pretty sound one on his part. Rita and I had a discussion coming up here. See, I think the devil's stupid. She's, oh, no, he's smart. I think he's stupid. And to me, clever and cunning does not necessarily mean you're smart. Because a smart man subscribes to the truth because the truth will always shine through. It's the reason why Jesus is referred to as the S-U-N of righteousness. And an ancient en uh, an entertainer once said, Elvis Presley, that the truth is like the sun. You can cover it up, but it will always shine through eventually. This is exactly where we are. It's amazing that that man made that statement. I wonder what was on his mind when he said that. 
Very profound statement. Very accurate statement scripturally. So the devil can cover the trip, and that's stupid. But what his goal is, if he can get everybody, and this is the reason for the Sunday law. This is the reason for the, for the first day Sabbath. If he can get everybody or eliminate those completely who, and this is stupid, folks. This is stupid. It's not smart. Off the earth that will obey God's commandments, live like Christ, and keep the Sabbath, what do you think he supposes will happen? God's going to say, oh, he can have it. I'm going. There's nobody there for me. That's what he thinks. That's what he's selling. That's stupid. Jesus, who appeared stupid to the world, today the most stupidest man that ever lived, if indeed he had all that power and did what he did, was the smartest man that ever lived because he used the devil's ambition, his stupidity against him to seal his own fate. That's the devil's fate. Not just here. But do you realize through the whole universe, they were all watching us. Folks, we are the video to the entire universe. There were still sympathizers with Lucifer up until the crucifixion, and this is why he could not turn back after, because right up to the crucifixion, Lucifer could have said, enough, I quit. And the Lord would have taken him back. But when he drove those nails through Christ's hands, it was all over. And the entire universe and the angels in heaven who were still having issues with whether Lucifer was right or not, the veil was ripped off Lucifer's face and his evil and ambition and stupidity were revealed. I can't imagine what it must have been like in heaven at that time. When he watched him brutally murder their creator, their commander in chief, chief, the one they loved, unbelievably loved, blatantly, violently, viciously, with extreme prejudice, murder him, it was over. That's why Jesus said it is done. Oh, yes, it was. Everybody's fate was sealed at that point. Because, again, it came down to two issues. The devil's violence and the blood of the lamb that takes away the sin of the earth. Folks, this is the Melchizedek priesthood. And there must always be in heaven and on earth a representative of the Melchizedek priesthood to minister the blood of Christ. Now, we're done today. That's laying a little groundwork. Next week, we're going to start at Zechariah 3. And then go to Genesis and continue on with Melchizedek. We're not going to take the Roman Catholic attitude because that's what Seventh-day Adventists believe, hands down, predominantly. That's what they believe. No, we're going to take the biblical explanation and point of view. So here we see the Melchizedek priesthood stems from the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the earth. And King Melchizedek is a representative of that. So everything deals with either the blood of Christ, the lamb slain from the foundation of the earth, or the violence and vengeance of Lucifer. It is all directed at God's Sabbath-keeping people. Every bit of it, every piece of history of this planet has to do with one of those two things. Every decision that every human being that has ever walked this planet in sin has to do directly with those two things, and that's what it is all about. That is the great controversy. Nothing else is relative, not Jesuits, not Masons, not entertainers, not politicians. Hey, not even Seventh-day Adventists. What is relative 
is keeping the commandments of G God and having the faith of Jesus. That's what's relative. So next week, I think it's next week, we're going to get into the actual Melchizedek priesthood. From this perspective, the lamb slain from the foundation of the earth and the violence and, and stupidity of Lucifer. I'm not underestimating Lucifer by any stretch of the, but, but he ain't smart. He's clever and cunning, but he's outsmarted himself. We're out of time. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you this Sabbath day. Again, Lord, your word is so simple. But we are simple children. We're even worse than that, Father. Compared to what you created in the Garden of Eden, we are miserable mutations. Physically, mentally, but spiritually, we can be intellectual giants if we so choose. If we so choose. Because we will be given the Holy Spirit like no other, no other people on this earth ever have been, and we can choose that, to have the mind of God, if we so choose, and to do the work that we are appointed. Praise you, Father, for Jesus, his blood, your Holy Spirit, his ministration, his office here, yes, him, he, as he is hopefully and humbly here now with us. Help us to get this work done in ourselves, in our homes, in our church, and in the world, that we may be a peculiar people, a royal, holy priesthood. Be with us this Sabbath day. Be with your people. And all those who are asleep, may they awaken to a loud, loud cry. And we may put an end to this. It's our choice. We chose this evil, every one of us but we can also choose to end it. And may we do that in Jesus' holy and precious name and on his precious blood, we pray, amen.